Welcome to the Virtualization and Cloud Security video podcast number five or six or whatever number it is. I think it's somewhere, maybe even seven. Is that in is, base 10 or base eight? Uh, something like that. Um, and that's like the 159th or so for the Virtualization Security Podcast roundtable that we've been doing for years now, I guess. Mm-hmm. And um, I'd like to welcome Mike Foley, who is from VMware Technical Marketing. He's in charge of vSphere and security and all the things that touch it. Cool. That's so me. That's, that's Mike. And today, Mike and I want to talk about something relatively straightforward, and it's very actionable advice. And that is, is that what are the top things you can do? And we're going to try to get to six. Six is the minimum, but we can go further than that, that you can do for free to secure your environment. In other words, the whole goal is it will not cost you to buy software at all. It'll cost you a little time, but this is to secure any cloud environment. We may be talking about the management construct of Amazon, or we may be talking about VMware vCloud or v, uh, VCAC or vRealize automation, whatever cloud mechanism you're using, we're gonna be talking about those as well. But we're gonna probably base it on things we know and things we do all day. So yep. that's what we're going to do, actionable advice. And I'm going to start off. If you're using a cloud service and it offers two-factor authentication, turn it on. Exactly. Let's start with that one. Turn it on. It's free. Generally, you don't have to pay more for it. It's already there. What was the name of that company that didn't turn it on that is no longer a company? Code Spaces. Code Spaces. They are the the poster child for turning two factor authentication on. So that's number one on my list. If you have it and it's free, if you have a cloud that has it, and by the way, every every major cloud that I know has two two FA. Yep. And whether you're using Amazon Azure, Rackspace, um, um, IBM's cloud, which was what's the name of that one? SoftLayer or any of the others that generally have 2FA, turn it on. I know vCloud, um, doesn't vCloud Air has 2FA, right? I believe so. Yeah. If, if it doesn't, it will be pretty darn soon. Um, I mean, almost, almost, as you said, just about every single major cloud vendor supports two-factor auth and two-factor auth in many different forms, whether it's sending you an SMS text message type or if it's using even Google Authenticator. Exactly. You know, I mean, I use Google Authenticator and I'm actually moving from Google Authenticator uh, to the app I use for managing all my passwords, which is 1Password, because 1Password now supports Google Authenticator. So I'm moving all of my codes out of the Authenticator app and into 1Password. And that's the nice thing. Google Authenticator <laughs> is free too. You can plug yep. it into just about anything. So. Yeah, I actually, I actually use it. it for my personal WordPress sites. Absolutely. Right. So there you go. The last thing you want to do is have someone take over your WordPress account um, when you're a blogger. You're t that is not good. And yes, the next thing is, Mike, what do you have? Um. Oh, wow. I mean, where where do we start? I mean, Some, just start anywhere. Yeah. I mean, it, it's kind of a rhetorical question. It's. Um, you need to, to, we've been saying this for years and years and years, and it's even more and more important that you start isolation of your management interfaces. Absolutely. And just, if you're a small shop and you can't af afford to isolate your management interfaces, I, I say, yes, you can. Even if it means just running uh, a, a NAT router of some sort between your uh, your the 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 land that everyone's PCs are on and the land that the management interfaces are on. Even if it was just that, that alone would mitigate an awful lot of yucky stuff. And if you're dealing with a cloud service, you can do <clears throat> that easily by using two-factor authentication, as we said already. Only the people with yep. the right keys can log in. <laughs> And you can actually set it up to only be log in a bowl from a management perspective from a specific network. Yes. So you can actually segment your cloud management <clears throat> from your cloud workloads using different networking constructs, even inside your own on-premises data center or lab closet or whatever you're using. 
And that could be behind a NAT router as well. I mean, I don't know how many times I've done this too. I mean, firewalls are free. I, I've, I can get a virtual firewall right now for free, download it, use it. Gives me the same exact thing as using a NAT route, physical piece of NAT router hardware to segment management versus everything else. Just yes. Number one. Number two, do that. It's so important. And Yeah, so I would say another thing, please don't use shared root account passwords. No. Especially if you have more than one person who knows them, <laughs> right? Because now all you need is one person to be compromised and someone now has your root account password for everything. Well, not only that, don't even <clears throat> use root. Yeah, I mean, well, this is, yeah. this is, this is a corollary ideally, to that. Ideally, you want to vault the root password somehow. And it's easy enough to do. What you can do, <clears throat> I mean, if you have a safe in your office or at home or whatnot, I mean, everybody can buy a fire safe for 20 bucks. Right. You have keys that are – one person has one key. You can get a two-key thing if you want. And you just put the root password right in there. You have to get the key from somebody else as a holder. In that way, you no. Know, if someone there's accountability for being able to get the key, the root password, you do you do that, you log in to root, but only as a break fix type of situation. Don't just log in to root because you can't. Yeah, and I mean, I, I, it may sound that we're we're talking about what should be really simplistic practices, and in some cases, you know putting the name of the system in the root password account on an index card and putting it in a fire safe might not necessarily be something that's terribly scalable, but you got to start somewhere. You do. And it, 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 you can then scale that concept of vaulting. If you're a bigger shop and have more funds to, to, to spend, you can uh, look into some of the software that's out there that's available for software vaulting your root passwords. Exactly. You can but check out your password, log in, and then check it back in, and the root account password is changed so no one can tailgate you. And there's actually a dozen tools that will do that. Right. You may even have them in your enterprise today, so ask. Right. Ask for an identity management tool that does root vaulting. If you already own it, use it. It's free. Right. If you don't already own it, go to the safe mechanism or just basically tell yourself, I'm not logging in as a root. There's no need to. Right. Unless you're breaking, unless something is physically broken. I mean, last time I had to log in as root to my virtual environment was today when I did an upgrade of the hardware, firmware. Right. And I didn't what even log should... in. I just basically connect up the virtual device to the ILO, the ILO and DRAC. And then from there, I said reboot. After evacuating all my VMs using vCenter or whatever I'm using, I was able to do that. But if I'm in a cloud, this still applies there. The administrator account for a cloud service should be vaulted. Use right. other accounts, not the administrator. This right. is a bad idea. <laughs> so, And one of, one of the other reasons for, for vaulting your root password um, is what you really should be doing is using named accounts. Now, whether those are named accounts that are coming from your Active Directory, if you're using Active Directory, or just I create an account on my ESX server called mfoley, uh, and I'm the only one that has the password for that, and I have all the appropriate rights and privileges to do whatever I need to do, um, just from a forensic standpoint of being able to go back and figure out what happened. If everyone is using the root account and you have eight administrators, forget you have, it. You have no idea which one of them was compromised. You don't. And named right? accounts, are, I mean, I think that's the, the, the best thing to do is you have use named accounts. You have an admin account. Yes. Password vault it some way create named accounts. I mean, I, the first thing I do when I get a new piece of software or even log into a new cloud is the first thing I do is take my admin account and create a named account and yep. forget, basically forget my admin account. I, I keep the password vaulted, whatever. 
I do with that, but I now have a named account. And if I have to give privileges to somebody else because I need them to do work, I give them another named account. Mm -hmm. Even if your named account is a full administrator, it's still not the root. Yes. There's things it may not be able to do, but there's plenty of stuff it can do. And this actually ties into when you're creating a cloud. Every service, every, every service that's a part of your cloud, whether it's a, and to be honest, this can even correlate to microservices as well. They all have to log into something. Every service should have its own unique name, username and password, so that what you can do is use a separate identity store just for those, or a subtree of Active Directory for just those identities yep. that are, you need those to survive because if the cloud go part of the cloud goes down, if you can't log in to fix something because Active Directory is part of your cloud and it went away, you need an alternative identity source to be able to do that. And it'll keep things running. Yeah, I mean, definitely using a named account for service accounts is a must. Is, a, is an absolute must. Just think of a vCenter environment where you have a number of service account type of things that need access to vCenter, right? Let's just say you have your backup. A backup, pro, you your have backup program, your, your, your monitoring security tools. testing program, your uh, all of, every time you open up an account, into vCenter, you now have a new attack vector. Exactly. Right? And I can't tell you how many times I see people just, oh, I'll just use the Windows Administrator account. I'll fix it later. And right? be honest, I've and done three I've got... years later, you find out that, you know, this backup, this, this, uh, this account that only needs read only privilege is actually using the administrator's account, which has full, full and complete privilege. And that's the one that gets broken into. And that's, to be honest, I actually went through that whole pain myself of my several, 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 several upgrades ago of taking everything I had. I used one account for a while. And the thing is, with, with vSphere and vCenter, there was only at one time only two service accounts you needed. Now you need a dozen just for vCloud Suite. Right. And then you add in backup, and then you add in everything else. And by the way, this translates to vCloud Air. You have the same service accounts for vCloud Air. vCloud Air is the vCloud connector. It needs a service account. You need to do backups. SRM and VR, um, um, vSphere replication need a service account, but they need it not only in your on-premises, it needs it in the cloud premise as well. Right. And then you talk about Amazon Azure and Google as well as SoftLayer and the biggies. The big guys are out there. They have service accounts that you're going to have to set up as well. Having a different user ID for each service account helps with several things. One is you can keep them separate from everything else and assign privileges properly. You can put them all in a seg segregated identity store if you needed to. But mm -hmm. the most important thing is, is that when it comes time to do forensics, those named accounts are now going to say, ah, the person came in through the backup user. He got to this part, but the roles and permissions I gave the backup user was read-only. So, okay, that's no problem. He got data, yes, some metadata exfiltrated, but it didn't actually use that to exfiltrate anything important. Yeah. Right? So yeah. the idea is, is you need to be able to use these named accounts for all services to determine who did what, when, where, and how, and you need to monitor those. And that's free, too. Just go in the log files and start grabbing data just for login, logout. I mean, that's tools available. Yeah, you can mean, use, use, there, you can, there's, there's a free there, version of Splunk to do that for you. Yes. And there's any number of other login capture tools, whether, you know, plugs for VMware's login site, which is amazing. Um, you know, Splunk, any, any number of other different tools that are available there to capture that stuff. And even if you're just setting it up just to search, or, or just to alert you on the login and log out of people, even if it was just used for that, you would at least know who is doing what. And if you see, you know, 
Joe from accounting's account logging in at 3 a.m. on a Saturday and you know that, you know, Joe really shouldn't be logging in at 3 a.m. from on a Saturday. That is one of your first red flags that something might be going on. Not only that, you can actually tell whether or not by if you do all this, and I monitor this myself using, and again, I do use LogInsight. I built a content pack around LogInsight to do that. It's freely available too. I believe it's on the Providence VMUG website. You can download it from there. Mm -hmm. um, but what I did was I monitor for anybody using root or administrator. And if I see those two, I get really, really upset because I shouldn't. Right. No one's using them. So why right. is someone using them? So then I then have a way of tracking that. Now you can get that out of the free Splunk. You don't have to send a lot of data to it. You can actually strip it all out using VMA or whatever you want to use. But remember, you also got the same thing in Amazon called Cloud Trails. It'll give you the same exact information that you're looking for. Azure has something similar. All of them have something similar that's free, incredibly important. So now we've got four or five items. So we need at least one or two more. Mm. These are the basics. This is like the lowest yeah. hanging fruit of virtualization security. Segregation, password vaulting. Don't log in as root. You don't need to. Right. Unless it's a There's broken very, machine. very few cases where you absolutely need to log in as root. Oh, and, and I, that should be a break glass scenario. Exactly. And people say, oh, I got to look at the logs. It's like, no, you don't. Turn on syslog and have it go to a log server like Splunk, or the free Splunk, or yeah, I, I, any I, I, number I, of log servers. VMA can be done. It's free if you're using vSphere. If you're using Amazon, take a log. I, I had a Syslog customer server. request come in the other day. Say, how can I increase? How can I uh, modify the logging on ESXi so that it can store more logs on the ESX server because the customer wants it to be able to store three months worth of logs or something like, like that? And I went, I... no. It's this <laughs> great product called Log Insight. Use that, or get a free free or log a free analysis tool. or whatever the case might be. It, it, it's it's really strange how some people think that. Oh, if I can just keep the logs on the source, I'll be okay. Actually, not. It, you're not, because what happens if the source gets compromised? The first thing that the bad guy is going to do is delete all the logs, or delete his entries from the logs if he's more subtle. Right. So, yeah, logging. There's there should be no excuse for for creating some type of syslog type of infrastructure, whether you're using paid for tools or free tools. And there's uh, a million and one free tools. So should, remember, we're doing this about do free, so just do it. There's a million and one. It could be to a cloud. It could be to a local machine. It could be anywhere. Just this is key. Right. And, you, and you can keep them for any length of time. You can archive them. You would need to know who did what, when, where, and how. And that's the corollary to having multiple users. Just keep the logs. So we got... Right. We got logging now. That's the syslog. That's absolutely important. And by the way, I don't care if you're using a cloud or not. This is an incredibly powerful tool. By the way, if you want a free version of, of a syslog sender from VM for Windows, there are dozens of them. Get one, use it. Yeah. Because Windows events are not syslogged normally, but you can make them happen and they can go yes. there. And then you can apply. And if you're using Log Insight, you can use the Log Insight agent that works on Windows, Linux, and a number of other operating systems. And there's one from Manage yeah. Engine. There's one from, I sure. think there's actually even one from Splunk itself. There's a number of different there's ones. There's a few, yeah. There's a few. And again, free is the key here for our little discussion. Syslog, use it, important, works from every cloud. So that's number six. Think we can get the seven? I want to do one here. All right. It's it's actually not a physical thing. You don't make a change to your system. Do a diagram of your system, your architecture. Draw it out so you know where all your holes are, where your weaknesses, where yes. everything's going. And that's what you can actually take an existing infrastructure, draw the do a physical diag wiring diagram, start there. Then you can do a layer on top of that one, a logical wiring diagram. And then from there, you can say, okay, where do I want to put my security? Right. Like, like the point I made earlier about having multiple accounts, having access to your, to your vCenter, this 
by by mapping everything out, you know, go find a whiteboard somewhere and map it all out. Yep. Right. Get an understanding of all of the entry points into your virtual infrastructure or your cloud. Remember, or your cloud. cloud. Um, um, understand all of the different entry points, who has access to those entry points, and then audit the privileges that those entry points have access to. Exactly. Right? Because the last, if, if you have, back to what I was saying earlier, if you have an account that really only needs read access, read only access within your infrastructure, why does it have? Why it, is it associated with an account or a user that has admin access? Exactly. These are things that you can absolutely do for free. It's really do the audit before the auditor does it for you. And by drawing and honestly, it out, they're not going to catch it. And and by drawing it out, it gives you a chance to actually re-architect your environment based on what you have already. There's too many times I've seen architecture diagrams, design arch design documents and implementation documents, and then finally the implementation where none of those documents matched each other. So if you're in a larger organization, make them match. Right. People are making Remem decisions off the documentation that affect your environment, and that's Rem a bad decision. Remember that um, not settling for the status quo is a process problem, not a technical problem. Exactly. And this is more right? of a – that and one's if, more process. If the answer you get when you suggest doing some of these things is, well, that's the way we've always done it, your response is the bad guys are always changing, always changing their strategies. Exactly. And you have to change your strategy. You have, One of the things you can do for free – is get out of your box, make a few people uncomfortable, <laughs> and change the status quo. But start with your own planning first before you go down those steps. Know what you're doing first, because right. if you say something that's not physically there or not in a document, you can't pull evidence back for you. And that's a right. key way so to do it. So if you go through that whole mapping thing in your office on a whiteboard and you have it all down pat and you start realizing, holy crap, the backup program has full administrator access to VMs when it really only needs the following privileges. Um, that is something that you can then go back to. And when they say, well, that's the way we've always installed it. I'm going to make a simple – that's say, a simple okay, change. Let's, let's start auditing the, 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 the backup program, and then you get a list of all of the security vulnerabilities that are that have been made against your particular backup program and go, I'm sorry, this isn't the way we should always be doing it. Exactly. You right? need you need to do your research, and I, this is also for free. And this actually we, – we talked about this many, many times in the past. It's like – even if you just take 15 minutes a week to go through and look at new things, you really need to step back and do that. Yes. The, people, the attackers are looking at new things every day, every yes. 15 minutes. They're not waiting just a little bit. It can't, you can't just be response, reflect, uh, um, you can't just respond to everything. You've got to do a little planning. So step back and plan. You can do logical. You can do physical. If the environment is huge, you may just want to break it down into blocks whatever you want to do to get an understanding of who who can get in and out and everything. And by the way, that actually even applies to the clouds. I mean, in Amazon, there's actually multiple ways in. Know all those ways. Right. It's not just the – I mean, you have the API mechanism. That's a different mechanism than logging in directly. Those are two. Then you have the workloads themselves. Those are That's the third one. Those workloads may end up being deployed through a Jenkins server that talks – to the management AM and deploys AMIs in the management console. Hey, that's a service account. Oh, I just thought of another one for free. And, and that, so Amazon has the same concept that you need to draw it out. Again, it most likely will be a logical drawing, but you need to do that. So the other one for free, let's say you go through this exercise and you map everything out. Maybe you do it all in Visio or you take a picture of your whiteboard. All of that stuff that shows all of these vulnerabilities, if you want to store those electronically, store those on an encrypted device. Please. <laughs> <laughs> Where 
You don't what have you a don't simple want, key. What you don't want is what a large movie studio had where all of the passwords were in a text file called password.txt. <laughs> Not a good idea. <laughs> don't make it that much easier for the bad guy who is already in your environment. And that's the thing. The other thing is, is this is for free advice, too, is realize that most likely the bad guy is in your environment and you're trying to find him. Yes. And that's a mindset change that is free to make, but it's one of the hardest in the world to make. Yeah. And, and talk about mindset changes. And I, I've got to finish up here in a moment. Um, if you are the security guy and you find yourself spending more than 50% of your time dealing with compliance issues, that might be time for a mindset change. And then you also requires a compliance person. Yes. Hey, it's a it's chance to hire somebody new. Hmm? Chance to hire somebody new. Yeah. Or train up I'm internally. <laughs> and I, I mean, I was thinking about there's another one, um, and it just was on the tip of my head, and it just left. We did pro this process as people, this physical, but when you get back down to the physical of everything, we've gone through segregation, we've gone through logging, we've gone through service accounts, we've gone through all that. Do not forget the workloads. Mm -hmm. Make sure you know how those workloads are implemented on your environment. For example, one thing that would be really bad is to have a workload on the environment that has direct access to the storage devices on which your environment lives. Yes. Be really bad. So, for example, if I was in a cloud like Amazon and I had a device that actually can actually control every EBS, all the all the storage for every VM or AMI instance. Yep. That device, that workload, should not have that. I, I encounter I encounter this a lot where people have installed uh, you know a small vSphere environment and they have one virtual switch and everything is on that one virtual switch. Fiber channel store well, actually not fiber channel but iSCSI storage NFS storage and what I've found Vmotion Vmotion um, bad idea VM kernel I mean, everything is on the one virtual switch along with the virtual machines. Yeah. So. A cheap and easy and free thing you can do is create virtual switches on a for a task basis. Create or a, virtual or, routing. Or separate them out with VLANs. VLANs, VRFs, whatever you want to use for virtual routing, you can do that in any cloud. Yep. You can do it with STNs. You can do it any number of ways. It's generally free to do, and you absolutely should do it. And for example, I have every hypervisor regardless of whose it is, and regardless of where it is, has five to six baked-in trust zones. Management, storage, vMotion, fault tolerance, if they're using it, um, and um, work, the, the workloads themselves. Um, and you got and even the workloads you might want to consider separating. Oh, you have to separate the workloads because right? the DMZ I mean, workload wanna, is different than a... You put all the web servers on one switch or port group uh, and, you know, block that off from others, whether you're using um, hypervisor-based firewalls or even if you just want to set up PF sense between between them. Exactly. Um, and, and just say, well, nothing other than port 80 and port 443 should be inbound into this web server and nothing other than, you know, a single port to the database server should be between the database server and the web server. I mean, that's essentially micro segmentation. Exactly. And, right? and, and that's that, great. And, and whatever you do, don't put any VM on any VM kernel port. Bad idea. With that, I've got to wrap it up. Oh, Mike, thank you very much. So everybody, you now have gotten eight, nine, maybe even 10 things you can yeah. do for free. It's the lowest hanging fruit. Keep things separate is the best advice. Users are separate. Resources are separate. Now, and send us what you want to hear. And th yeah, Give us please. some ideas. Give us some ideas. And we'll um, hopefully see you guys all at VMworld. Yep. Ciao.